Uh, this is the reason that we are committed to expository preaching. It's the reason that we are committed to exegesis of taking from the Bible what it says to inform our doctrine, to inform our theology. It's, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people about what they believe, and it is important to deal with people about what they personally believe, uh, but they say things about the Bible that uh, uh, gets me a little bit exercised. Some people have spent time going to school to be dentists or engineers or that sort of thing. And uh, if a person who knows nothing about dentistry were to start just saying, well, I'm convinced that you know you brush your teeth about once a month and you're good, that's fine. A dentist would not only have personal beliefs about that and say, that's not true, but would be able to say, you know, I've studied this for years and there is absolutely no evidence in the universe to support what you just said. Well, I want to say to you right now, where I have spent my time academically, <laughs> uh, is, is this true? Can this be trusted? At least one that was a part of it. And I'm just telling you, there's no evidence in the universe that, that we've lost one word of what God has preserved for us. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why I can uh, stand up here and say we can answer the question, what's going on? We can answer that question. The world, many in the world have been asking that since March, right? What is going on? My world has turned upside down. Why? What happened? Well, the Bible is the, is the place that we look for that. J.C. Ryle uh, was considered by Charles Spurgeon to be uh, one of the greatest preachers uh, of that time period. And I would say if Spurgeon is saying you're a great preacher, that's pretty, pretty important. But J.C. Ryle in his book Practical Religion said, give me a candle and a Bible and shut me up in a dark dungeon and I will tell you everything that the world is doing. I think that's the best reason to believe the Bible. It nails it. Every detail about what's happening in the world. Including where the world is headed. What's going on geopolitically, socially, all those things. And so, even though the Bible does not have a single passage that explicitly lists the events of time and history in chronological order, we need to acknowledge that. There is not a single passage, one passage that, that explicitly lists the events of time and history in chronological order, although there are a couple that come close. There's not one. There is sufficient information that is clear enough to establish the basic timeline of history. The Bible tells us what's going on and what's going to go on. We are currently in the church age. If you look around... Very closely, you can see some evidence of this. I meant for that to be a little bit funny, but I, we're in a church building. These are church people. Evidence that we are in the church age. We're in a building with a sign outside that says Desert Ridge Baptist Church. This is the age in which the body of Christ, that's us, is, to, is the witness to the world about how to be reconciled to God in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. The next event on the biblical calendar, on the timeline of history, is the snatching away of the church by the head of the church Himself, the Lord Jesus. This event is commonly called the rapture. Now we are to encourage one another with the reality that all in Christ will be caught up to meet our Lord in the air, both those who have died already in Christ through resurrection and those who are still living when that event occurs. Now today, we're talking about the time period between the rapture and the second coming. We just sang the prayer asking the Lord to uh, teach us the heights of His plan. 
uh, for us and, and for the future. This, this is why this passage is in Scripture. You might ask the question, why would the Lord tell us things that are going to happen on the earth that's not going to affect the church? Uh, I think there are two reasons so that we have more and more confidence as we th- see those things being set up. And secondly, uh, so that people who uh, do care what, what the Bible says at that time, there will be those who will not rebel against God completely, will not worship the Antichrist, uh, and Scripture uh, provides them information. But it gives me great confidence to look toward the future and see detail and clarity and not just uh, unreadable darkness. The Lord hasn't done that. He's told us. He's told us. So let's read uh, a passage that describes the next next era, the next next time after the rapture of the church. And it's called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. This is after the rapture. Now, we're going to talk about in heaven and on earth, but this is focusing mostly on earth. But this is the day of the Lord. And what are we going to do? What are we going to be doing during the day of the Lord? What's going to be happening on the earth? Here's, here's what he said about the earth specifically 1 Thessalonians 5 1 to 11. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, and forgive me, but I'm going to stop right there and just tell you. The preceding passage is about the catching away, the harpazo, the the rapture of the church. And then we see the next part, now concerning, and we've already established it in our study of Paul's other letters in 1 Corinthians that when Paul says now concerning, he is introducing a new topic. That's, That's not disputed. That's in the commentaries. People see that. That's clear. But what that means is that the day of the Lord is not synonymous with the coming or the rapture. Uh, it, 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 it reaches its manifestation on the earth at a, at a point that is uh, now unmistakable. But there are two different, two different topics. Now concerning the times and the seasons, and that phrase I also want you to know, that is a biblical phrase for the end times. It is used in Daniel. It is used by our Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. And there's the reason why we need to know these things, so that we're aware of what's coming and we keep awake and stay sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night, or drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And here's the key. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So we've already got the application about the knowledge of the day of the Lord. When we learn what's coming, what do we do with it? Well, we encourage one another and we build one another up. So here's a way that that would play out, for example. Uh, Hope and I were on a, a mission trip to an unreached people group in Peru, the Yakaru people. We were on our way. Uh, and by the way, that, that sounds cool and romantic and glamorous, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound in the Andes where the road had played out? There were no vehicles able to go any further. It was all on foot. 
And of course, the boroughs that had been negotiated, then we needed eight for our party. The guy showed up with three. And guess who got to play the role of a borough? For a long way, both just distance and up. And it lost its glamour. It lost its novelty. And it was just... Uh, I'm tired. How far are we going? Uh, and a partner who it's we did not know this would happen, but a man who is now uh, has been a partner with us uh, said he was on that same trip, and he said uh, this this hill he called it a hill. It was a mountain. This hill that we're climbing is grace. And there was notable in the feature, facial features of people just like, yeah, I'm not following that. I'm not, I'm not with you, man. He said, well, is it, is it literally the lake of fire? Is it hell? No. He said, well, if you're not experiencing the lake of fire, at any moment you are experiencing the grace of God because you deserve the lake of fire. If you're not in it, then you're experiencing either God's common grace, you haven't died yet in your unbelief, giving you perhaps opportunity of repentance, or you've been saved and you're never going to go there. But however you want to look at it, if it's not hell, it's grace. And so there's a way we can encourage one another and build one another up because this says God has not destined us for wrath. So if you're down and out and sad about what all is going on or whatever, then we can encourage one another by saying, we're not destined for wrath. A whole bunch of people are going to experience the wrath of God, but praise God, He has saved us from wrath. We can be joyful. So there's an application. Now, let's talk more about the details here about the future. This description of the day of the Lord pretty bleak right it's of darkness it comes like a thief in the darkness and by the way the rapture does enter uh, does usher in events of the day of the lord um, that we call the tribulation and it's bad and this this description of it being darkness and it being wrathful and bad and in this passage you have a contrast the day of the lord comes on them but we are not of the darkness hope you saw that notice that it's always them Another place that you see that uh, is in the same letter, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And I don't think I got this one on there anyway, guys. So 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we, we have covered it in the past, says, talks about Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come, but then it talks about the persecutors of the church in chapter 2 and verse 16. And it says, uh, God's wrath has come upon them at last. And it, and, and it just says in the original Greek, Wrath has come to the end, into the end. It's going to, is basically what he's saying. On them, though. On them. So we're not destined for wrath. Does that, does that kindle any gratitude in you? If it does, would you say amen? <laughs> amen. This is consistent, though. This description of the day of the Lord is consistent with the more than 20 passages I've I read one source of 24 different passages that talk about the day of the Lord in 11 different books of the Old Testament on this topic. So, if you ask the question, why are you talking about the day of the Lord so much? And I would say, because God talked about it so much. I mean, isn't that the agenda we're trying to follow here? We need to know what God says we need to know. And if He talks about it that much, it's something we ought to pay attention to. The day of the Lord. Uh, in this ser sermon, we're, we're covering that period following the rapture, both in heaven and on earth. And I'm going to give you just a little rundown uh, of two categories after the rapture in heaven and on earth. But we're talking about that period between the rapture and the second coming, that part of the, the day of the Lord. That's, that's really the, the main part. But, but really, it could say the day of the Lord goes on after that. It's just that the day of the Lord is emphasized as being a time of tribulation, a time of punishment and wrath. And so kingdom is the better word for after the second coming. Uh, and we'll, we'll 
I'll give you some verses about that. Now, this is a seven year period. And you say, how do you know that? Well, we know that from Daniel chapter nine, verses 24 to 27. Daniel chapter nine, 24 to 27. This is a seven year period. It's an important passage to study to study. Now, during this time, Israel's enemies led by Antichrist will persecute and seek to destroy Israel out of evil, selfish ambition and hatred for for God. This time, the day of the Lord, the tribulation, uh, the second half of which is more particularly called the great tribulation. This time includes the wrath of God poured out on the wicked, unbelieving inhabitants of the earth. In fact, there are multiple times called the earth dwellers. They're the them, not the we, when Paul's contrast. But there's another purpose there. It also includes a purpose of the chastening of Israel that, that ultimately results in the restoration of Israel through national repentance and faith in Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus. In fact, that's what basically all the prophets say. That is the theme of the prophets. According to Zechariah 14, from the Old Testament, and Revelation chapter 19 and chapter 20, in fact, Revelation 19, 17 to 26, at the second coming of the Lord to earth, that's different from the rapture. you got the rapture, seven years of tribulation, then the second coming. At the second coming of the Lord Jesus to earth, He will destroy the Antichrist army that is on the verge of destroying Israel. Uh, he will destroy that army completely. He will cast the Antichrist and his false prophet into the lake of fire. He will bind and seal Satan in the abyss. And he will rule as king then over all the earth for a thousand years. And I, I would encourage you to read Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19, 17 through 26 and see how very clearly the things that I just listed to you are found in those passages. When you, when you read both of those together and they're about the same event, all those details are clear in either one of the passages or both of them. So what I just read to you, if that doesn't happen, then the Bible's not true. Now you might try the solution, well, well let's just spiritualize it. The problem is once we've done that, we've lost all authority, haven't we? Because there's no way to determine, well, then what did the words mean? If they don't mean what they seem to mean, who says what they mean? Each individual person? That's not absolute truth, is it? We've lost all authority. So since we're not going to abandon all truth and authority, we're going to go with what the Bible says and it includes those. Listen again to the things that I said that He's going to do. At the second coming of the Lord Jesus to earth, He will destroy the Antichrist army that's on the verge of destroying Israel completely when, he, when Jesus arrives. He will cast the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. He will bind and seal Satan in the abyss. Uh, he will send an angel to do that and rule as king over all the earth for a thousand years. Now, the church, that's us, the, they're called in uh, most circles of the end, people who study the end times, the Old Testament saints, uh, the faithful of Israel in times past, and the tribulation martyrs, those who refuse to take the mark of the beast and those who are killed because they won't worship the Antichrist, they're promised in Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6, to reign with Jesus. So our position does not include what we read in 1 Thessalonians 5. That's on the earth. We're not of the darkness. That's on the people of the darkness, the earth dwellers. We will be in heaven during that time. Uh, but we will come back with Him, very clear in Revelation 19, when He comes back and He wins the battle and then He sets up His reign and we are part of His government. We have responsibilities as He rules the earth and all creation for a thousand years. The, uh, during this 1,000 year or millennial kingdom, millennial means a thousand, the thousand year kingdom, restored and redeemed Israel along with those among the Gentiles who sided with and aided God's people Israel during the tribulation will populate the earth in bodies like we have now. You can read about the judgment of the Gentiles. The new, at least the New King James top, uh, has as the heading of that, that passage the judgment of the Gentiles. Some say the judgment of the nations, which nations and Gentiles is synonymous, 
Uh, but some take that to be just the general judgment, which is not possible for a number of reasons. We won't go in that today. But that's in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. That's the judgment. So, that's going to happen at the second coming. We're raptured out. Tribulation, which is part of the, the bulk of the day of the Lord or the emphasis of the day of the Lord in biblical descriptions. And then the second coming when He sets up His kingdom. So what does the Bible say about after the rapture is going on for the church in heaven? After the rapture in heaven. I'm going to give you a, a couple of events, uh, but we won't, we won't spend a lot of time on it. But the judgment seat of Christ happens. Now you can read about this explicitly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15, and also in chapter 9, verse 27. Now this is a judgment of those who have the foundation laid, which is Jesus. Paul said there can be no foundation laid other than the one that is laid, and that is Christ Jesus. So we're not talking about whether or not you have Jesus or not. He's talking about those who build on that foundation of their own salvation with good works and how those works will be, well, works, and those works will be judged. Now, the worst case scenario in this judgment in verse 15 includes the salvation of the person, but the loss of any rewards for works because there were no works that were done for the glory of God. That should cause us to tremble. What a terrible thing at the culmination of all of salvation history to show up there as one of the redeemed for whom Christ died and rose again and to be told by Him, you did nothing that's worth anything in My kingdom. The only thing that can be said of you is you're saved and you're here. Now it's interesting to me that it is not until after a thousand years later at the end of the thousand year kingdom that God says, that it says, and God will wipe away every tear. Could be that yes, you're part of the reigning and the government, but that you do so in the lowest possible position, uh, knowing that you your work was burned up. But the point here is that n that's the worst case scenario at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is for the we people. We are of the day. We're saved. But look in Revelation 19, 6 to 10, and I want to show you the second event that we need to know about an event in heaven. Revelation 19, 6 to 10. Oh, yeah, by the way, that 1 Corinthians 9, 27 verse, that's Paul saying that he does not want to be disqualified for reward. 1 Corinthians 9.27, that's Paul saying, I want to avoid the worst case scenario. He's not saying I don't want to lose my salvation because he teaches over and over that salvation is not a commodity that we get, we achieve or gain for ourselves and then aren't able to keep. Salvation is the free gift of God given in Christ Jesus. So either we're saved or we're not. And that's not based on our ability to get it or to keep it. Uh, but the reward is a different story. Uh, so serve God so that you will be among those who receive crowns as rewards and you're able to cast them at His feet and say you're the one that's truly worthy. And that's what you want. Revelation 19, 6-10 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of many peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Here we have clearly the bride of Christ, right? The bride of Christ wearing fine linen, bright and pure, which signify the, the righteous deeds of the saints. 
Now, did we not just talk about an event in which the deeds of the saints will be evaluated to determine which ones were worth something and which ones weren't? So if the bride is clothed now and it's, our, it's granted her to clothe herself, in other words, a judgment has been given for her to clothe herself, and this, of course, is a corporate bride, it's all of us, with fine linen, bright and pure, that means the judgment about the works have already happened, right? Now, where is this event? This event is in heaven. You say, how do you know that? Because Jesus is about to return to earth and the bride is going with Him. Look in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. Now look in verse 14. And the armies of heaven arrayed in what? Fine linen, white and pure, were following Him on white horses. And then the rest of it describes His coming to the earth and defeated, defeating the Antichrist and the false prophet and their armies. So if we're coming from heaven, if this, and this is clearly the same group, the armies of heaven dressed in fine linen, white and pure, the bride of Christ granted her to wear garments that are fine linen, bright and pure. That The Holy Spirit doesn't deal in coincidences and well... I, he has never thought this about any verse in Scripture. I should have clarified that. He has never had that thought, ever. What is recorded is there on purpose. It's meant for us to see it. The same group that is the bride is the group that's called the armies of heaven following Jesus back to the earth. If, we're coming, if Jesus is going from heaven to earth and so is the bride, then the bride has to be in heaven going back to earth, to earth right? And what's, what has happened on the earth? The build-up the build uh, under the Antichrist and the false prophet of armies to attack the people who corporately won't worship, and that's Israel at that time. That's the problem. See, the, the Israel is great with the Antichrist until halfway through when he said, you know what? I think I'll move into the temple. You can worship me. And even Israel in her unbelief in Jesus the Messiah has never gotten to that point where they would say, okay, yeah, that'll work. They don't do that. They're persecuted for that. And they're almost persecuted to extinction. In fact, two out of three of them, two-thirds of them are wiped out. A third of them are alive and left when Jesus shows up and puts a stop to that. And that's when they put their faith in Jesus. You can read about that in Romans 11. But that's another, that's, that's, that's the second part of this. And we're going to have to save that to next week. But we have at least covered today what happens after the rapture for us. Two events, very important the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb. And that prepares us. You know, I don't know how we'll how we will process that seven years in heaven. Uh, I know that seven years will go by on earth when we're in God's presence, when we're with the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. I have no idea if that seven year period on the earth will feel like seven years in heaven or not. But earth history is still involved here, and so we know that that's seven years on earth between the rapture and the second coming. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be uh, rewarded for our work. Now look, think about that for just a minute. Who really did the work? Jesus did the work. None of us died on the cross for others' sins. We're not qualified. We have our own sins. He did that. He rose from the grave. He defeated death for us. He called us to Himself. And then the lavishness of His grace. The lavishness of His grace has set us up to attend an event in which He will reward us for our work. He is the one that's worthy. But when we, that's where we're going to be. 
It's not one big resurrection and one big judgment and then separation. That's not what's going to happen. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3, the worst case scenario is not cast into the lake of fire because your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. On the other hand, when we get to the great white throne judgment in Revelation 19, the best case scenario is to be thrown into the lake of fire. There's no mention of any salvation, of any saved person there. So there's two judgments there. One, the, the worst case scenario is you're saved, but your work is burned up. The other, the best, is the lake of fire. That's not the same judgment, is it? That's not the same judgment. So for us, praise God, the judgment seat of Christ where we get rewards because of God's grace given to us and the marriage of the Lamb where it is granted to us in a heavenly scene to wear robes of fine linen that are bright and pure like badges that declare the glory of God because of our righteous deeds, really that He worked through us. Praise God. That's, that's where we're going to be. Now next week, Lord willing, we'll look at what's going to go on on earth. And when you look at that, there are signs all around us that this is shaping up for what the Bible says. Uh, all around the world, there's evidence that it's shaping up uh, just as it's going to be during the day of the Lord. So we'll look at that last week. I hope that you are able to encourage one another, build one another up with what we've learned today from the Word of God. And if you're here, let me just tell you, you do not want to be on the earth for the day of the Lord. The only way, you, you cannot impress God, you cannot buy God's favor. The only one uh, that is whose name is exalted the highest possible name and who's been exalted to the highest possible degree according to Philippians 2 is the Lord Jesus. He's the one. Uh, we get to... Salvation is as if instead of having to turn in my resume of my life, which is full of sin and corruption and even the best of my good deeds are tainted with sinfulness, with pride, with all of that, my resume would never pass and it would only earn me the lake of fire. But I get to turn in as if I lived the life, the resume of the Lord Jesus. No sin. Everything to the glory of God. And the reason I can do it is because He paid the penalty in God's justice. God never lowered the standard to give me mercy. He carried out the penalty of His justice against sin on Jesus in my place and in the place of everyone who is a believer. That's, that's the situation. Friend, if you've never done that, if you're trusting in your own good works, I'm just telling you, I am certain the Bible says you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. But if you trust Jesus and His person and work, then there's no power in the universe that can separate you from the love of God. And you will spend eternity with God forever. Father, thank You for the truth of Your Word. Draw people to You, I pray. Draw, draw us all to You by grace through faith. We love You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine and preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria.